as you know, we are continuing in Paul's letter to the Romans. And he begins the letter on kind of a, a bit of a sour note where he says that all people are kind of messed up. Uh, see if you recognize these lyrics from a well-known song. They're creepy and they're kooky, mysterious and spooky. They're altogether ooky, the Adams family. Do you know what the name of your ancestor is? Adam. You know what family you're in? Now you understand where we're going with this. That doesn't mean we're always awful on the outside. We can polish the outside pretty well, but we fall so short of God's glory. We sin. We go our own way. We do think we're born alienated from God. So that's why I say we're all part of Adam's family, and that's a big problem. But a, a lot of this letter is about how God has wonderfully rescued us. He's delivered us by his just indescribable grace, his love. He, he lavishes on It's a one-way love. And what we bring to it is our sin. We say, here, look at my sin. And Jesus takes it on himself, and he dies to it. And then instead we are given Jesus' perfect righteousness. And when you get to chapter 12 in Romans, we find out what that leads to. It leads to a life of freedom where we're no longer under pressure to have to, to be better compared to someone else or have to always be right or more attractive or have to try to impress people with being more spiritual. And we certainly are free from having to try to be happy from doing things that the Bible says is sin. We, we, don't try to, we don't sin to try to find joy. We, don't, we have Christ. See, whatever you need, and I mean whatever you need, you already have it in Christ. Now, you may recall last week when we began to look at chapter 14 in Romans, uh, that, there, that Paul talks about two groups of people that are in the Roman church. And there's evidently some real uh, division that's coming into the, the body of Christ there. There were the, the group that Paul calls the weak faith Christians. They weren't weak in character, but they, they were weak in understanding and, and fully applying the benefits of the gospel of Jesus, the benefits of Christ's death and resurrection to their life and to their lifestyle choices. They, they, they were, they they were hypersensitive, and they said, well, we better not eat any, any meat because maybe it was from a pagan marketplace and maybe a pagan priest blessed it, so we won't have any of that. And some of the wine may have been in a pagan ceremony, so we won't drink the wine. And, and we got to eat only the foods that the Old Testament, the kosher foods, says we're allowed to eat. And they had all these rules, and they felt they had to do that. But that was how uh, they were expressing their devotion to the Lord. Then there was the other group of Christians. We may call them the freer Christians. And they expressed their devotion to God in their freedom. They were less strict. They said, oh, you can eat whatever you want. The Old Testament's no longer, like the, old, the kosher laws are no longer in effect. And and I don't care where my hamburger came from. I don't know, care who blessed it. It's just hamburger. God made it. I'm going to enjoy it. And, and they just were a lot freer. And Paul wants these freer Christians to be respectful and welcoming of the more sensitive Christians, not to look down on them, not to exclude them from anything in their lives. We all have the same Lord. We, we all have the same boss. We talked about that last week. And Christians, as you know, Christians can disagree about a lot of stuff. Now, there's some things the Bible teaches very clearly, and that's not what Paul's talking about. But he's talking about all the other things that the Bible does not spell out. Like, I mean, how, what kind of clothes do you wear? What kind of music do you listen to? Or what about, what about your politics? Or what kind of entertainment do you enjoy? And there's, there's a lot of room for individual choice. And Christians often disagree with one another about certain things that they do or feel, or feel they shouldn't do. Uh, and, and, you know, getting along with people we agree with is really easy. It does, you know, it's not hard to do that. But if we can get along with people we disagree with on some of these non-essential matters, that can really show the power of the gospel, where we realize that the main thing about our lives is not, you know, my opinion about this or your opinion about that, but we are owned by the same Lord. We're part of the same family. We're in Christ. So, that's sort of where we're at. If you look at Romans 14, uh, we're going to jump into verse 5 here, where Paul writes, giving some more examples of the kind of conflict they were having at that time in the church. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. So some of these more uh, sensitive Christians thought they better keep on observing all the Jewish holy days from the Old Testament. And they were, they were careful, and they thought a good Christian 
should observe all the Old Testament instructions about the Passover and Pentecost and what we call the Feast of Booths and maybe the Sabbath. Now, the more knowledgeable Christians realize that those things were just a shadow of Christ. And now that Christ has come, yeah, I mean, if we want to observe Passover to be reminded of what God did, that's fine. But we're not under obligation to do that. We don't have to keep those Old Testament uh, holidays. We're no longer required to keep them. Now then, Paul says something here that may really surprise you, though. He does not say, oh, these things don't matter. He does not say, oh, quit thinking about it, and I'll just give you the rules that apply to everybody. No, he says, each one should be fully convinced in his or her own mind. He allows for individual you know, decisions to be made on this. And as you study the scriptures, and you're walking by faith in Christ, you will come to certain convictions on non-essential matters that the Bible does not clearly spell out. And what Paul says is, he doesn't say anyone's dumb or anything like that, but he says you need to follow your convictions. And, but as you follow your convictions, you definitely will. I mean, don't, don't wonder. You know for sure you will find yourself in disagreement with other Christians sometimes over non-essential matters. Uh, and, and you're not always going to agree on the same course of action to honor God. You may not always agree on, on what is sinful exactly. You may not agree on the best way to apply biblical truth in a particular life situation. Uh, I, I think of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was going, this is, this is a much bigger thing than just what kind of food to eat. But when Bonhoeffer was a pastor in Nazi Germany, he was pretty much a pacifist. However, he came to the conclusion that in the current situation he was in, he ought to be involved with a plot to try to assassinate Adolf Hitler because he thought it was necessary. Now, some Christians would say a Christian should never, ever do that. Uh, Corrie Ten Boom used to deceive the Germans and, in effect, lied to them about the fact she was hiding Jews in her house. Other Christians would say you shouldn't even try to deceive the authorities, even when you're trying to save someone's life. It, it's not always clear. Christians sometimes come to different opinions about things. You know, a lot of companies... Have, uh, have quality control, and they have therefore hire quality control inspectors, and they're important. They have to make sure that the products made are, are going to stand up and not fall apart. You, you maybe have to test a certain alloy of a metal to make sure it won't crack under stress, or make sure that the, the thingamajig works the way a thingamajig is supposed to work. You need people with an eye for detail uh, and, and recognizing flaws, and that, that's, for the, that's for the good of the company. Quality control inspectors are vital in industry. However, it doesn't work in the church very well. It doesn't work in the body of Christ. You know, there's all different levels of Christian maturity and Christian understanding. And it's going to be that way until Jesus Christ comes back for us. And if you're expecting every single Christian you know in this congregation or in other churches where maybe you've been, if you expect everyone to be at the same level of maturity, and everybody to agree on all the details of living the Christian life, you're in the wrong place, and you're going to be a really frustrated person because you, you, Christians will never all be on the same page about everything. And another thing it's important to remember is you and I don't know enough to take it upon ourselves uh, to be the judge, to, to be the quality control inspector in another Christian's life. Now, if someone's doing something that the Bible clearly says is wrong. If someone's stealing or murdering or having sex with someone they're not married to or they're, they're, they're bad-mouthing people and threatening to kill people or something like that, you know, you can say you're wrong. But there's a lot of things that aren't in that category. So we have to be careful about how we evaluate people. Chuck Swindoll tells a wonderful story. I don't know if you've heard it before, but Swindoll tells about a time he was speaking at a week-long Bible conference. He spoke probably a couple times a day for five days. And, he, and right off the bat, he noticed a, a couple that came, and, and they introduced themselves to him and told him how glad they were to be there. And they sat sort of down in the front. And Swindoll noticed that after he had been preaching for only 10 minutes, the guy would always nod off. Or maybe he did some of the, he would nod off. And he would sleep. And at first he thought, well, you know, everybody gets tired. But then this would go Monday, Tuesday. By Wednesday, he was thinking, this guy, this guy's a, a spiritual Neanderthal. He probably doesn't even want to be here. He's probably here because his wife drags him here. He doesn't care about spiritual things at all. Just look at him, just sleeping through everything. And so he got more and more irritated. Thursday, he was just fuming when he looked down at the guy in his seat. By, by Friday, he just 
I think he wanted to break his neck or something. But then after the final session on Friday night, and after everyone else had left the auditorium, um, the, the, the man's wife came up to speak to Swindoll and said, Chuck, can I talk to you for just a minute? And, and she said to him, thank you so much. We were, my husband and I were so glad to be here. Thank you for your messages. Because my husband has terminal cancer, and he only has two weeks to live. And he takes really strong pain medication, and it makes him really drowsy. He's really ashamed of how he falls asleep. But he requested that one of the last things on his bucket list he wanted to do was to come to hear you speak at a Bible conference. And then the woman left, and Swindoll said he felt like he's about <laughs> this tall. He said, oh, I, I, he thought this was the worst guy in the world. And she, he thought the woman was going to say, oh, I'm married to this spiritual lout. Or is a lout or a clout. Or, anyway, you make up a word for him. And, and, and turned out that he loved the Lord, but he was dying. See, you and I have to be careful. We can say that sin is sin if we see someone doing something wrong. But when it comes to, like, evaluating the entirety of someone's Christian life, you know, how are they doing? You don't know where they've come from. You don't know their personality all the time. You don't know what they've struggled with. Yes, sin is sin. But when you, when you and I try to evaluate as if we're the master, we're quality control, it's really easy for us to be way off. So remember, Jesus gives the evaluation. It's not you or I. So look at verse 6. I want to go further in this text. And Paul explains more and says, the one who observes the day, now he's talking about the issues at that time, 2,000 years ago, observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. He says when, when a less knowledgeable Christian, a more, a more um, strict Christian, uh, feels obligated to try to keep like an Old Testament Sabbath or to observe certain feast days like Passover or says they're, they're not going to eat any meat because they don't know if the meat was blessed by a pagan priest. They're doing it for the Lord. Now they may be too tough on themselves, but they're doing it for the Lord. It's an act of worship through which he or she gives thanks to God. And those who are more free need to respect that. When a more knowledgeable Christian feels free to eat meat from anywhere, or to not keep the Old Testament festivals, they also are doing it, who? For, who? For the Lord. And what unifies us is greater than what divides us. It's the blood of Jesus unites us. That's what's really important. You know, there's different ways of seeing things in life. I don't probably have to tell you that. God has made some Christians, uh, because of their their temperament or whatever, they're real strict. Like some Christians are really strict about going to the movies or watching movies. Other Christians feel more of a freedom in that area. If you talk to a lot of Christians, there's a lot of different opinions about things. I know of some Christians that will not watch the Steelers on the Sabbath. They won't watch anything on the Sabbath. They won't read the newspaper on the Sabbath because they, they honor God, they believe, as an act of faith. They just treat Sunday like such a different kind of day. That's their conviction. Other Christians don't, aren't so strict about the Sabbath. And, and we could come up with a lot of other things. You want to find out what people, different views, you just go around Facebook, and you'll be amazed at what people, people you know, the stuff, the stuff they post. People have to see things in different kind of ways. God deals with us as his beloved children, as individuals. Yet corporately, we're all the body of Christ together, but he also deals with us as individuals. Some doctrines, some teachings in the Bible are meant to be applied universally, everywhere, by everybody, every time. They're always true, and it's real, they're black and white. It's very clear. But when it comes to people's personal experiencing, people's experiences, it's not, it's not always so black and white. You know, what God loves about you is your faith. He loves that you trust it. God loves faith. That faith is more precious to him than gold or silver. silver. And, and that faith, as it moves through the grid of personal, an individual personality, and through different kinds of backgrounds, different kinds of experiences, it may lead us to have different lifestyle convictions on non-essential areas. And if we understand this, we'll all be a lot happier, we'll all get along a whole lot better. You know, I knew of a guy, I, I didn't personally know him, I knew of him, who attended a seminary, and, and he had a job in seminary, and he would park cars at a strip club. Now, he did not, I will point out, he did not go into the strip club. 
So he did not see what was happening, but he, was, he parked cars. And he actually had an opportunity to get to know some people and start a Bible study to share the gospel. Another Christian may look like at that situation and say, I would never park cars for establishment like that. I don't approve of that. You see, Christians come to different conclusions. I once read an article by a guy who was a Christian bartender. And his, he, he said, I go to a 10 bar, and people come in, and at a bar, they'll let their hair down like nowhere else. They'll talk about stuff. And he would sometimes talk about Christ to them when they'd share what was going on in their lives. Now, for another Christian, that would be the wrong thing to do. We come to different convictions about these things. Uh, so for someone else, for some Christian, they could not do that in good faith, and they shouldn't. See, that's why Paul says, let everyone be convinced in their own mind. You're doing it for the Lord, and everything is the Lord's. And, but the, the funny thing is sometimes we're going to come to different conclusions. Two people that both want to glorify God may go about things a little bit differently. And what Paul is saying is respect the brother or sister who sees things differently. And, and this may surprise you, but two Christians could have completely opposite political views and both be living to glorify God. Two Christians could have very different issues, very different opinions about what to do in certain situations, but both be seeking to glorify God. You could have one person who's a colonel in the U.S. Army and by faith in Jesus Christ wants to serve God in the military. You can have another believer who says, I believe as a Christian I ought not to be involved with military service and be just as sincere and love the Lord just as much, but they've come to very, very different conclusions. What's important to God is that you act on your faith in Jesus Christ. That's what matters. And you therefore should never look down on a Christian with a different, kind, different conviction because he or she is already pleasing to God. If someone's in Christ, just as the Son pleases the Father, so the Christian in Christ pleases the Father. God is pleased with your brother or sister, even if some of the things they say in Facebook seem like the most ridiculous things you ever heard of in your life. If, if their political views drive you crazy, if some of the way they view, the way they want to live life seems so ridiculous, but if they're in Christ, listen, you respect them as that. They're a brother or sister, and they are pleasing to God through their faith in Christ. Now, verses 7 and 8, Paul continues, and he says, For none of us lives to himself, none of us dies to himself, for if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Notice how life and death function like two bookends on a shelf. And they're meant to include everything there is between life and death. And everything there is in your life, who you are, it's all about, if you're, in, if you're in Christ through faith, it's all about Jesus Christ. It's all for him. So whether you're alive or dead, or whether you're swimming or sleeping, or you're drinking a Coke, or you're, you're eating a cupcake, or you're telling a joke, whatever your, your whole life, everything you do as a Christian is for Jesus Christ. That's what he wants us to understand. So you and I are servants. We're living to please our common master, our common Lord. So my master, Jesus, is going to reward me. Someday I'm going to stand before him and he's going to reward me. And you'll stand before Jesus and he's going to reward you to your faith. So it's not my place to put a label on someone or to evaluate someone outside of my, my realm of, of expertise. It's not for me. I, I'm just a fellow servant. It's not your place to speak for Jesus in evaluating me or others. Now, if you see someone doing something that's sin, you can call it sin. But in non-essential areas, be careful you don't come up with a label on if that's a good Christian or a bad Christian. or They don't love the Lord as much as so-and-so. And, you know, we can come up with all these labels. And it's, listen, everyone's going to get their reward from Jesus. You don't have to play, uh, play a quality control inspector. Well, verse 9, he continues and says, For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Because Jesus is Lord over every Christian, we must respect each Christian's relationship with Jesus. I read a story this week. Uh, it, it, in fact, I don't know I, what the ultimate the source was, but uh, it's, it's a cool story about a guy in, in Romania in 1941. You know, the Romanians were allies of Adolf Hitler, and of course, uh, the Soviet Union was very much against the Germans. And so uh, at one point in 1941, uh, the Soviet Union invaded part of Romania. And there was a Christian young man in the Romanian army by the name, I'm going to say his name wrong, uh, Anna Gorge. And Anna was a, a young soldier and a believer. 
And when the Russian troops invaded part of Romania, Anna and his comrades were frightened. There were bullets going off everywhere, mortar shells exploding, and it just made the whole earth shake. And by day, Anna would seek relief by reading the Bible. By night, he was so terrified, he just sort of hugged the earth and tried to recall all the verses he had memorized as a child. Well, one day there was a spray of enemy fire, and Anna was separated from his, his company. And in a panic, he bolted and went deeper and deeper, running into the woods until he huddled at the base of a really large tree. And then he fell asleep from exhaustion. The next day, he woke up, and trying to find his comrades, he moved cautiously back towards the front, staying in the shadow of the trees. He'd nibble on a a crust of bread or maybe stop at a stream and drink some water. And hearing the battle closing in, he he unslung his rifle, and, and and he pulled the bolt, and he watched for the enemy. And his nerves were just ready to snap. He was so terrified. And then 20 yards away, a Russian soldier suddenly appeared. And and Anna was just horrified. Let me read you his own words. All my mental rehearsals of bravery served me nothing. I dropped my gun and I fell to my knees, then buried my face in my sweating palms and began to pray. While praying, I waited to feel the cold touch of a rifle against my head. And then he says, I felt a slight pressure on my shoulder close to my neck, and I opened my eyes slowly, and there was my enemy, my enemy, the Russian soldier, kneeling in front of me. His gun had been thrown into the wildflowers next to my gun. And his eyes were closed in prayer. We did not understand a single word of each other's language. Believe me, Russian and Romanian have nothing in common at all. But we could pray. And we ended our prayer with two words that need no translation. Alleluia, amen. Then after a tearful embrace, we walked quickly to opposite sides of the clearing and disappeared beneath the trees. Now, can you think of two people who had less in common? They were, like, trying to kill each other. They were trying to shoot each other. They spoke different languages, different backgrounds, different uniforms. And those two believers knelt down in the woods there, and they prayed together. We have to remember that what what brings us together is the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is, is thicker than anything else. What really matters about another believer is that they are in Christ with you. And they are righteous the same way you are. They're forgiven the same way you are. And, yeah, you're going to have differences of opinion, but... You're one family. And that is what I believe Paul is saying here. Yeah, we're all like porcupines trying to hug each other to keep warm in the middle of a blizzard. And we sort of poke each other a whole lot. That's, that's what it's like. What Romans 14 is, it's the guide for Christians to get along with each other. If, if you want to do something to help your attitude towards someone, because sometimes other Christians will irritate you. Sometimes they irritate me. you got to pray. If, if there's a Christian that bothers you, some of their ideas drive you nuts, you should pray for them. I mean, it'll change your life. Pray for God's blessing on that other believer because we are all family. There's no room to be a snob. Verse 10, Paul asks, why do you pass judgment on your brother? And that would include, or on your sister. Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Notice how brother appears twice. Why are, you, why are you judging your family member? Uh, maybe a believer says, you know what, I, I was raised with certain rules, and I just got to keep those rules. I, I was raised, I just, I just got to do that. Uh, and, and maybe you're a more knowledgeable Christian, and you know those are rules are just man-made. They don't have to keep those rules. They're not commanded in the Gospels. They're just based on a faulty understanding. And for you, they seem so unnecessarily strict. And, and maybe it really bugs you, and you're tempted to look down on that person. Remember, they are your brother. They're your sister, purchased with the same blood of Jesus as you. So don't look down on them. Don't ignore them like they have yellow fever, but receive them, love them, welcome them. You know, there may be a believer in church. Maybe there's someone that seems so lax to you. You're so careful about what you do. Maybe, maybe someone mows their grass on Sunday, or they, or they spend way too much money on clothing that you think a Christian should do. Maybe Maybe they, they color Easter eggs when they should be talking about the resurrection. You know, you want to get Christians going. You talk about holidays or Christmas or Easter you see, or, or even Halloween and see what happens. 
Maybe, maybe you, you see a Christian that eats in restaurants that seem like a really unsavory place or, or, or you don't like what they, they say on Facebook and sometimes you just shake your head. Listen, remember, they're your brother. They're your sister. Now, if they're doing something the Bible says is wrong, in love you can talk to them about it, but you're not a quality control, control inspector. Remember, that brother or sister that seems kind of lax to you, they're loved dearly by the same Lord who loves you. And the reason we must not despise one another are in these words at the end of the verse, for we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Now, I used to, I used to read that and <laughs> run away. I used to read that and interpret that. That means I better be really kind to everybody or Jesus is going to punch my lights out someday. You know, I'm going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and, man, I didn't love people enough. That's not what it means. God's, Scripture's not going to contradict everything that we're told about the gospel, that we're righteous because of Christ's righteousness. But what he is saying is each individual believer is going to have a personal audience with Jesus, and each believer will be rewarded by Jesus. He rewards the faith that he's seen in action in our lives. It's not you or I that take that upon ourselves. Jesus will do it for each one of us. So you don't, you're free. And look at it this way. You are free from having to be a quality control inspector. You're free from having to feel like you have to fix everybody. To, you're free from having to evaluate the quality and motives of another Christian's life. You can see what their outward behavior is like, but you can't always judge their motives. It's pretty much impossible. Jesus is the one who does that. The other Christian is Christ's servant, not yours. So you do the things that Jesus, you please Jesus in your own life. And, and you understand that you're going to do that differently than some other Christians are going to do. Now Paul backs up what he's saying with a quote from the book of Isaiah. In verse 11, he says, For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess, or every tongue shall give praise to God. You realize all of human history is headed to one final ultimate event. Every uh, political statement, every argument by an atheist, every social movement, every military com campaign, everything that goes on is going to eventually, it's all going to wind up at one final destination. Everyone's going to bow their knee to Jesus, to Christ. Every tongue is going to confess or give praise to God. You know, in our culture, our culture does seem to be getting more and more hostile to Christianity. Now, we're not going to be written up in Voice of the Martyrs yet, but the fact of the matter is there seems like to be a growing dislike of Christianity. I've read of some Christians who were dismissed from Ph.D. programs because of some of their Christian views. Uh, some schools are threatened with losing accreditation, and then there's just sort of a general, what do you mean Jesus is the only way? There, there's, there's a growing mood. Uh, but you know what? It's important that our response be uh, one of compassion. Compassion. Because what it's really, it's all going to head to Jesus, that, final, that ultimate destination where every knee will bow. And unbelievers are headed for judgment. If they reject Christ, they will go to hell for all eternity. I mean, that's, that's an awful thought. But we should have compassion for people who reject Christ. And, but for believers, to stand before Christ is, is reward, and it's a happy ending that goes on forever and ever. Paul sums it all up in verse 12. He says, So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. God determines the reward for each of his servants. You and I don't have to be determining the reward for one another. Jesus will do that. You know what they say? At the end of a chess game, the, the king and the pawn go back into the same box. You know, you might be real impressed with someone in this life or think you're better or less than someone or some people may have a real public life, some more private. But listen, at the end of the day, it's, we're going to all confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We're going to stand before him and re re receive rewards as his beloved children. And that's what really matters. We're, and then we're going to spend, you and I are going to spend all eternity together. Now, some of you thinking, mm, all of us? Yeah, all of us are going to be together but we need to remind ourselves of this. Now, I'm going to wrap things up by telling you how very uncomfortable I have been preaching this passage. Because when you're a preacher, you're telling people how to live your life, you can get kind of smug. You say, ah, you should be more like me. But I want to tell you something. When I go through this passage, I see so much failure in my own life. I, I see I'm faced 
with the truth that I don't live like I should. You know, I remember a time, I maybe told you about this once a long time ago, but I met a friend of mine in seminary named Tim and when I was f- just starting off seminary. And there was another guy, we used to call him, uh, what was his name? I, I'm not going to tell you his real name. We'll call him Joe. And Joe was so strict about everything. And Tim and I would be with him, and sometimes we go, oh, this guy, he's just, he can't, this is wrong, that's wrong, can't do this, can't do that. He just, just, just was always sort of judgmental. It was exhausting us. I remember there was one, and you know, I went to get to Tim to get him, and, and, to, and we were going to go do something together. And we had to go by this guy's room. We call him Joe. <laughs> and, we, and I remember we, we, we didn't want to be with him. Now, it's, there's nothing wrong if the two of us want to be together, but the way we did it, we were so awful. I can remember we sort of, tiptoed by his room like a couple of brats, giggling, we we're going to get around this guy. And, and we heard, we, he heard us. He knew what we were doing. We heard his feelings, and we weren't very straightforward. I really, I really feel like a jerk, even to this day, uh, when I think about that. Just really wanting to exclude someone or in, in such a rude way. Somebody tells a story about a guy that used to confess his sins. He, he struggled with a particular sin. And he'd, he'd, on Monday, he'd sit and say, oh, Lord, forgive me. I did it again. Please forgive me. Then he'd do it again on Tuesday and on Wednesday. He finally gets to Saturday. And he says, oh, God, forgive me. I'm so sorry. I did it again. I hate it. I did, I did it again. And then it's as if he heard an audible voice from God saying, what sin? <laughs> what sin? I don't remember your sin. You're forgiven. So we look at a passage like this and we say, Yay, we're free in Christ to be accepting of people who have different opinions than us in the body of Christ. But even so, we know we're going to fail at times. We're often not going to live up to that. And that's what we need to remind ourselves of the gospel. Yeah, but Jesus forgives me. He doesn't remember my shortcoming. I'm completely forgiven. We remember that Jesus is a friend of sinners, and he never despises the one who comes to him in faith. And Jesus, he was welcome. He always gets it right. He always got it right. And his, that his always getting it right is reckoned to us. So God treats us as if we've always loved everyone perfectly all the time. You've got to remind yourself, because the more you remind yourself of that you are forgiven and that Jesus, his welcoming everyone is credited to you, you will ironically become more welcoming and kind and receptive to other people. It's sort of counterintuitive, but that's the way it works. Let's pray. Father, We praise you because Jesus is a friend of real sinners, and we are real sinners. Father, thank you that in Christ, you're you're never going to think, our sins will never be brought up again. They're gone, they're done, they're thrown away. And you see us, you treat us like like you treat your own son. He deserves the glory that goes on forever, and that's how you treat us. We thank you, and may we focus on that And then work through us so we become more loving and accepting of those believers who disagree with us on certain non-essential matters. Protect us from being, keep us from being judgmental because we go to that real easily because we're always trying to justify ourselves. Help us to realize we don't have to justify ourselves. We're justified in Christ. That's what validates us. 